the week three of Advent, and all through the aisle, no child could sit still, not even for a while. The adults in their pews with bated breath wait to sing Christmas carols before it's too late. Enough with this Advent, with preparing away. I've had it with darkness and gloom. Oy vey! But instead of sweet scripture renewing our mood, we're accosted by John and his shouting, You brood! Here we are a bit more than a week before Christmas, and the last person we're in the mood to hear from this morning is John the Baptist. Never politic, living a crude, far from socially acceptable life, rudely invading our polite lives. He is astonishingly misfit when the calendar says December 16th. Imagine, Will Willman said, putting John the Baptist on a Christmas card with the greeting, our thoughts for you in this special time of the year are best expressed by the one who said, you brood of vipers, who told you to escape from the wrath? Merry Christmas. <laughs> but like it or not, here is John, standing between us and Christmas. John, the lead player this Sunday, when we'd much rather get on to a way in a manger. Give me that sweet, cuddly baby over the skinhead survivalist type any day. But here's the truth. We can't get to Jesus without dealing with John. John's function, like that of the prophets before him, was to, to expose, to unmask, tell the truth. And truth tellers are often not welcome, are they? And so if John invades our space, shouting, repent. Now the root meaning of the word that John uses is to make a 180 degree turn. In other words, you're going the wrong way. Turn around or you'll miss it. John isn't interested in provoking feelings of guilt or beating us up because of our behavior. John is all about transformation. What happens when we buy into John's message as we turn around is that our refocused thought processes, our changed minds, and our corrected vision alters everything that we're about. As John preaches repent and points to Mary's first boy, he's reminding us Jesus is coming. Coming, not so that we can feel different, but that we can be different. John's Riverside Sermon in good Princeton Theological Seminary training has three points. Notice my don't usually. <laughs> so goes that good training. And he jumps right in, not giving two hoots about being politically correct. He says, you are a brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now that's one way to get your audience on board. It's important to understand that, that these folk he's talking to, that have come all the way out to the wilderness by the Jordan, these are not some kind of wicked, irreligious types. They were a whole lot like you and me. Regular, worshippers, among the pious even. These are children of Abraham after all, but God, John mocks their proud heritage. Mere lineage, simply being born and functioning week in, week out as Jews is not enough. Karl Barth said it this way, the Christian life cannot be inherited as blood gifts, characteristics, and inclinations are inherited. God desires more than perfect attendance. God desires our hearts. Not rote mechanics, but radical commitment. Flannery O'Connor noted, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you odd. And that oddness 
promise will inevitably bring conflict and even suffering that will disrupt our comfortable lives. John says that, that God's presence is like a lumberjack hacking down limbs. Now there's a Christmassy message for you. Most people believe that when the Messiah arrived, their problems would be over. Their crops would grow, their bank accounts would multiply, the Romans would be sent packing with their tail between their legs. But John suggests that the coming of the Lord will not be all sweetness and light, but in fact a fearful day, a time of purging and exposing when no amount of pretending or posturing will work. Don't tell me with your mouth. Show me with your actions. Bear fruits worthy of repentance, he says. Every Sunday we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But are we really ready to make the heavenly pattern of things our marching orders? The night before he was murdered, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at the Masonic Temple in Memphis, rallying support for the city garbage workers. And he said, it's all right to talk about long white robes over yonder in all of its symbolism, but ultimately, people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey, but God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat three square meals a day. It's all right to talk about the New Jerusalem, but one day God's preacher must talk about the New York, the New Atlanta, the New Philadelphia, the New Las Vegas, the New Memphis, Tennessee, the New Stanford, Connecticut, the New First Presbyterian Church of Stanford, Connecticut. Notice, as John slides right into his second point, that his call to bear fruit, his call to action, is really simply and very practically doable. He says, if you've got two coats, give one to somebody who doesn't. And if you have enough to eat, share it. You know, don't swindle anybody in business either. Mother Teresa didn't leap tall buildings in a single bound. She didn't part the Ganges River. She simply did what any of us is capable of doing if, oh, there's that big old word, if we have the will. Now, we're pretty good at sharing stuff at Christmas time. Take a dog, red kettle, my car was packed to the gills with your giving tree gifts when I dropped them off at family centers this week. And even the curmudgeonly John would have to smile or at least nod in approval. But John's appeal wasn't, isn't, a seasonal one. John Wesley said the doctrine of the devil is doing good when you feel like it. Food insecurity isn't only an issue in December. The homeless shelter is open 12 months a year. John's third point is also about perspective. Impressive as John was, he was not the main man, which was perfectly okay with him. He was well content being the second fiddle, tanto to the long ranger. He was far more concerned with making sure that people didn't miss the main event, not with who got top billing. John announces that the one coming will baptize with fire and spirit. Now that sounds serious, and it is. But God's fire is never for destroying, it is for purifying. God is interested in cleaning us up, not turning us into ash. Listen to Thomas Merton. 
as a magnifying glass concentrates the rays of the sun into a little burning knot of heat that can set fire to a dry leaf or a piece of paper. So the mystery of Christ in the gospel concentrates the rays of God's light and fire to a point that sets fire in our spirit. John doesn't urge anyone to mimic his bizarre mode of existence out in the wilderness. His call is for people to live differently exactly where they live. What a powerful challenge that remains today for us. I am under no delusion that one of my sermons is going to make you take off for the mission field or to leave all that you have behind for a life devoted for prayer and service. We have jobs, families, responsibilities, mortgages. But none of that gets us off the hook because John challenges us to live as resident aliens in the normalcy of life in our society. In, but not of, out of step, marching to a different drummer, listening to different orders. Also note that John the Baptist's call to repentance is not just for the individual. He calls the people at large, the broader community, to account for their waywardness. This is social gospel that John is raising up. And can you doubt even for a moment that we don't need a shot of social gospel today? The kinds of cultural forces that squeeze us into behaviors and thought patterns are so subtle and seductive as to be invisible to us, or we just take them for granted. And John, with no concern for political correctness, not a worry about stepping on toes, reminds us that God will never Absolve the person who is content to have too much while others have too little. Christmas can be an especially insidious time. The holy season transmuted in a sort of two month long festival of gluttonous consumption. Imagine what John might say about our frenzied shopping and partying when it's time to be getting ready for the invasion of Christ into our superficial, materialistic, noisy lives and country. Small wonder <laughs> that we'd rather bypass John on our way to Bethlehem, no? His threefold sermon calls us to a radical kind of commitment. One we dare not equivocate upon. But as much as we might rather take a different route, Advent always comes before Christmas. Without prepare away and repent, there will be no news of great joy. No, to you is born a Savior. We'll listen, you and I, amidst the torn wrapping paper and the heavy laden visa bill. But I heard John exclaim as he vanished from sight, Turn around! Please don't miss him! And to all a good night. Amen.